evening, and thank you for coming. Um, most of you, I think, know my, my name is Casey Watson. I'm the outreach worker here at Murray Street Baptist Church. Um, and I understand intellectually and academically the notion of slowing down. Um, but, I, but I have to say that tonight I'm not a very good living example of it. I am actually in two places at the same time at this very moment. I'm at Bolarama with 20 other people bowling, uh, as well as being here. And I'm not sure whether they've missed me yet, but I'm hoping to be there very quickly. And uh, hopefully my score hasn't suffered too much from my absence. Uh, the way I started, it probably hasn't at all. Um, not that I, I try to make everything a sermon, but when I knew what Dad was going to talk about tonight, I, it reminded me uh, a, a piece of scripture way back in the Old Testament that I've always enjoyed. And, and so I want to share that with you for a moment, and then I'll introduce Dad, and then I'll turn it over to him. Way back in First Kings, we don't spend a lot of time sometimes in, in, with our Old Testament prophets, but way back in First Kings, there's this, there's this wonderful scene where Elijah is frustrated with, with the people, with the Israelites. And uh, they have rejected him and killed all the other prophets. And uh, Moab, the, uh, the bad guys uh, in the scene, they've got 350 prophets. And they're, they're strutting around. They're doing really, 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 really well. And Elijah is so frustrated. And he's hollering out to God, what have you done? <laughs> you know, why, why, why are you treating me this way? Why are you letting my people treat me this way? And so they set up a test. And the, the Moab guys, they say, yeah, well, if you think you're so big, well, why don't you have this happen? And Elijah says, well, if you think you're so big, boy, where's your God? Is he on a trip to have him set this on fire? And so uh, Elijah erects this great big uh, um, setup, and the, 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 the people challenge him to have God set it on fire. And Elijah, indeed, prays to God, and at the snap of a finger, it bursts into flames, and all the water around it is, is evaporated. And you can imagine Elijah, yes, I, I, I've got you, my God is on my side, now you'll get it, right? But then the next chapter, uh, Elijah, uh, 1 Kings chapter 19, Elijah is still frustrated and still upset. People still aren't listening to him. And he hears a voice that says, go up the mountain. And so he goes up the mountain. And he hears another voice that says, or the same voice, why are you here, Elijah? And, and this is what happens. Elijah, uh, the voice says, go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed him by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire there was the sound of a gentle whisper. And it was God saying again, why are you here, Elijah? Unless we be still and take time to quiet down, we'll miss the quiet whispers. God's not in the earthquakes. He's not in the fires and the windstorms. And if we run too fast and if we surround ourselves in too much noise, we'll miss those quiet whispers. And so, for many reasons, mental health, physical health, productivity, being still and calming down, that will, I'm sure, tell us is important. But I think it's important for the sake of our eternal soul as well. Now, I'm not one to take one small passage out of context, and there's much more to that story of Elijah than, than I'm sort of suggesting tonight. Now, you remember that hymn out of the Amble, the one that we use every once in a while, Be Still and Know? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's important not, not just for how we get through our day, but how we relate to our God, too. Anyway, having said all that, our speaker tonight, Murray Watson, is my father. Um, I, I know him as a father, of course. And my dad is a, uh, was a farmer and a school teacher. Uh, he's a retired school teacher, and, and mostly since retirement, well, he was always a writer, but especially since retirement, he's had time to, to spend on his writing. He's written uh, a number of books, uh, bibliography, as far as uh, his family memories, uh, some memories of my sister and I, some of them I'm not sure are 100% accurate, but they're all interesting. <laughs> Uh, and, but he's also written on his own struggles with depression, he's spoken about that here, um, and his own um, understanding and the journey how to come to some sort of peace and serenity uh, in all the chaos that goes on, not just in the world around us, but in our minds within us too. And so I think he has a special insight into how important it is to, to be still, or in his language, to, to slow down. And so Dad, thank you for coming tonight. There will be a collection taken later on, just a free will offering. There's no ticket, no price of admission. 
but all collections will go towards uh, Murray Missions, which is a, a project that, that I'm sort of responsible for in our, our local outreach uh, here in Peterborough. So thank you for coming, and uh, thank you for speaking. In the past, when Casey's introduced me to you all, he has mentioned that he's known Casey uh, Murray Watson for 40 years. And I just want you all to know that I've known him for approximately the same length of time. <laughs> Most of you know that Casey has a position here in the church. Uh, as well, he has a maintenance business. He has a legal business, caveat management. He writes for a legal firm. And um, last but not least, he's taking a Master's of Theology through Tyndale University. So we all know he doesn't have to listen to a speech on slowing down. <laughs> In any case, thank you, Casey, and Godspeed. You're welcome. Well, thank you very much. In my second year of teaching, I was still returning home holidays and weekends. And at Christmas in 1965, I was driving my first new car. And at that time, I didn't subscribe to the notion that getting there was half the fun. I had just crested the big hill and was sailing across the snow-covered ground to the bend south of my parents' farm. And suddenly, an army truck snowplow was coming straight toward me. How a collision was avoided, I don't recall. What I do recall was what Theodore MacArthur, the snowplow driver, said to me, slow down! My friends, I'd like to share with you a brief glimpse of three reasons to slow down in life. Speed can be dangerous, God doesn't use a blowhorn, and less is more. One, speed can be dangerous. First, if you or I had lived two or three hundred years ago and came back today, what would we notice? Would it be instant mashed potatoes, jet travel, email? I expect we'd see this emphasis on speed in personal achievement also. Don't our expressions give us away Getting ahead, getting to the top of the ladder, getting to the front of the line. And what is usually implied is a bigger paycheck, a particular car, a larger house. But does this desire to get and get ahead quickly come from our true self or from the ego? Definition, egotist. A self-centered ass who has more stuff than I do. In Lewis Carroll's story, Through the Looking Glass, in case he referred to this last week, Alice is running hand in hand with the Red Queen. And the Queen keeps urging her on, faster, faster. And at long last, Alice finds herself sitting on the ground, propped up against a tree. And she says, why, I believe We've been under this tree the whole time. Everything's just as it was. Of course it is, said the queen. What would you have it? Well, in our country, said Alice, still panting a little, you generally get to somewhere else if you were running as fast and as long as we've been doing. A slow sort of country, said the queen. Now here, you see, it takes all the running you can do just to, just to keep in the same place. If you want to get somewhere else, you must run at least twice as fast as that. Now, if you're anything like me, you may feel sometimes that you're in the Red Queen's country, where it takes all the running we can do just to keep in the same place. One time after I'd started driving, but hadn't yet learned how to change a tire. I was returning from Peterborough to Havelock, where I lived, and I had a flat. What now? And it was nearly dark. Then a former high school classmate, a young man who was said to be part of a motorcycle club with a bad reputation, noticed me, pulled his bike off the highway, and changed the tire for me. Thank you, George, thank you. Around that time, I was planning to enter seminary, and I thought, would I be as willing to help someone out of a jam as George had been to help me? In fatal auto accidents, unsafe speed is nearly always present. 
In the spring of 1971, I was traveling south on Highway 69 between uh, Perry Sound and McTeer, hurrying to get to work on time because I'd left home late, for a reason not of my own choosing. There was a small group of children standing off my side of the highway. One young boy walked slowly toward the road, and when his foot touched the pavement, I sounded the horn and touched the brake. He stopped and looked in my direction. Then, obviously miscalculating the time it would take my car to travel that distance, he started running across the highway. And despite my forcefully hitting the brakes, he died in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. Following that, I would have dreams, nightmares. I'd be driving the car in a schoolyard full of little kids or on a congested sidewalk, and the steering wheel of the car would not work, nor would the brakes. These lasted for years, until at another hard time in my life, I wrote a letter to the police, divulging information that I had omitted in the at-the-scene interview, including the fact that after I had come to a stop following the horrendous collision, I had backed the car up a certain distance with the intention of hiding my speed. The good book says, confess your faults so that you will be healed. The philosopher Lao Tzu said, nature does not rush, yet everything is accomplished. Isn't it ironic that in this world of fast food, high-speed internet, instant credit, instant cash or instant credit. The fastest growing sport in the United States is slow pitch. Rex Bradley, retired VP of Louisville Slugger, a baseball bat manufacturer, reports that organized slow pitch softball grew from 25 million in 1970 to 45 million in 2010. That's an increase of half a million individuals per year. It's also becoming a, a sport of choice in elementary schools as an alternative to baseball. He says, it is a wholesome sport that has posted the most consistent growth rate of any of the nation's major sports. It is also one of the fastest growing international sports and is now played in over 80 countries. Why? <coughs> I think it's because it puts a greater emphasis on cooperation and fun. For one thing, when you're up to bat, the pitcher is on your side. Many of the new players are women, plus many men who find baseball and uh, fastball more frightening than fun. Simon and Garfunkel said, slow down, you move too fast. You've got to make the morning last. Some experts uh, uh, suggest we apply the slow lane mentality to every aspect of life. Banks recognize the problem of speed. I once heard a teller say, do you want it done fast or do you want it done right? Some go as far as to say, handwrite all your letters, grow your own food, cook your own meals. Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci said, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Nutritionists point out that eating food fast is as unhealthy as eating fast food. Since a nearly full stomach signal <clears throat> takes 20 seconds to reach the brain, eating fast usually means eating more. Mark Twain said, the best exercise for losing weight is placing both hands on the table edge and pushing back. Of course, he also said, eat what you like and let the food fight it out inside. <laughs> Growing up in a family of seven children, all born within ten years, the only familiarity I had with fast food was how quickly it seemed to disappear from the table. In the Harvard Business Review, Tony Schwartz writes, how would you feel if you knew your surgeon was rushing through your surgery while checking emails and writing texts along the way? Well, you say, you have any examples of other important people taking their time. Would God do? When Abraham was 75, 
God promised Abraham and Sarah a son. They got their son 25 years later when Abraham was 100. Another example, after leaving Egypt, the Israelites walked across the Sinai Desert, a distance of about 200 miles straight across. Now the average adult walks one mile in about 20 minutes. But let's say they walked only one mile each day. At that rate, they would have walked across in 200 days, just a little over half a year. They took 40 years. I guess Moses would have agreed with Gandhi. There is more to life than increasing its speed. Whether they were chewing gum, I don't know. What they were not doing was walking in a straight line. In your life, does, it, does your life seem to be a frenzy? Lily Tomlin says, for fast acting relief, try slowing down. And that brings us to number two. God doesn't use a blowhorn. When I taught school in Fisherville, Jan, my colleague next door, had three rules for her students. Sit up, shut up, and listen up. Woody Allen said, God is silent. Now, if only man would shut up. God speaks in a still, small voice. Casey mentioned the gentle whisper in the book of Kings. The Bible says, and I think he said it also, be still and know that I am God. It is not in frantic, noisy activity that we come to know he is and know his will, but in silence. Max Ehrman says, go placidly amid the noise and haste and remember what peace may be in silence. And therefore be at peace with God, whatever you conceive him to be. And whatever your labors and aspirations in the noisy confusion of life, keep peace with your soul. Would Moses have noticed the burning bush if he'd been dashing off text messages while tending his father-in-law's sheep? Or if he'd been listening to loud rock or rap music, if rap is music? Woody Allen said, I took a speed reading course and read War and Peace in 20 minutes. It's about Russia. On March the 30th of 2010, Mary Hines of the CBC radio program Tapestry interviewed a professor of theology um, at a university in Indiana. As I recall it, he had come to think that when it comes to doing what you believe you ought to do, that having enough time is more important than knowledge. To test his theory, he set up an experiment. His subjects were all students in the Divinity School. Each was to present a homily, and the subject of the sermon was to be the parable of the Good Samaritan. You may know how the story goes, I'm sure most of you do. A man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho is beaten, robbed, and left lying in a ditch. Then first a priest, then a Levite, see him and pass by on the other side. Then a Samaritan, a pagan of no fixed address, despised by the religious status quo, feels compassion for the man, cauterizes and dresses his wounds, puts him on his own donkey, puts him up in a motel overnight, and in the morning promises to pay on his next time through any extra debt incurred on his behalf. To return to the professor's experiment, the students were to deliver their speech to an audience on the far side of the campus, and one at a time they had to walk all the way over. On the way was a ditch, and lying in the ditch was a man apparently beaten and in urgent need of help. What were the results? About half stopped. How did the two groups compare? Of those who were told they had lots of time, nearly all stopped. But of those who were told they were running late, none stopped. Yet all presumably knew the will of God. That was the subject of their, of their study. And the very subject of the sermon they were just about to present was to love your neighbor as yourself by showing mercy to someone in need. In my life, 
Do I stop and show mercy to someone in need? The way George did for me when he pulled his motorcycle off the highway? If not, is it because I move too fast? When I'm speeding through life, it's like I'm wearing a horse's bridle with those blinders. <coughs> For the faster I move, the less I see in my peripheral vision. So I'm oblivious to someone standing beside the road and needing my help. Slowing down allows us a better picture of others. And what we do for others, we effectively do for ourselves. The Old Testament says, He that refreshes others shall himself be refreshed. Turn it around. If I were the one lying in the ditch off the Jericho Road, would I want the next traveler looking at his watch? The poet educator uh, Anne Lynn Bada said, If today thou turnest aside in thy luxury and pride, wrapped within thyself and blind to the sorrows of thy kind, thou a faithless watch doth keep, thou art one of those who sleep. Slowing down to look doesn't count unless I stop to help. A policeman uh, noticed a man slow down at a stop sign but not stop. And he pulled him over and asked him why he didn't stop. And the man replied, well, officer, I slowed down. The policeman pulls out his billy club and starts beating him. Then he asks, now would you like me to stop or slow down? I don't know if you've ever had occasion to read the Christmas messages of Queen Elizabeth II, but I was surprised by her frequent allusions to the parable of the Good Samaritan. <coughs> Next to the parable of the prodigal son and the sheep farmer who searched for that lost sheep until he found it, I guess it's my favorite too. As head of the commonwealth of so many diverse nations, she obviously saw its universal application. It's clear from the parable that Jesus' test of religious correctness was not belief, but behavior. What the Samaritans believed about God was quite different from what Jesus believed. Yet of the three men in the story, Jesus said the Samaritan alone fulfilled our highest duty to love your neighbor as yourself. And his instruction was to do what the Samaritan did. Deeds trump creeds. We hear what the lawyer said, what the Samaritan said, most importantly what Jesus said, we don't hear what the victim in the ditch said. Assuming he belonged to the majority religion, I wonder what he said the next morning when he woke up in the inn. Heretics, we called them. Our God, they did not know. Yet two of ours on the other side passed by, and one of them comes into the ditch where I lie. That Samaritan was my neighbor when among the thieves I fell. Himself he saw at the edge of death and carried me back from hell. Heresy, said the wounded man, in tones not loud nor low, isn't what you may believe, but mercy not to show. And did we recall that Christians were first called followers of the way? in the book of Acts, I wonder if Christians would have maintained their original loving behavior if they had maintained their original name and not wreaked terrorism against fellow Christians they labeled heretics and against Jews and Muslims in the Crusades, including women and children, by methods including beheading and burning alive. In the First Crusade against Jerusalem, the church's official chronicler reported that blood in the streets ran above the ankles. When those called followers of the way of Jesus have murdered their so-called enemies, those called Christian believers who put a so-called creed, correct creed, above benevolent behavior, obviously did. If you had to choose would you sooner be known as a believer or a doer of kind deeds? Or turn it around. Would you like your neighbor to be a believer in a correct creed or a doer of kind deeds? <coughs> Especially if your neighbor 
was of a different religion. Jesus did not say, he that believes or recites the correct creed, but he that doeth his will shall know of the doctrine. He also said, inasmuch as you have done it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you have done it to me. Can you hear yourself think? Turn down the external noise and listen up to the still small voice inside. And that brings us to part three, less is more. When my daughter Jillian was eight years old, I heard her say to her brother Casey in the yard, you know, I feel better when I give something away. The modern mantra, something new and different, works very well for business, but not so well for peace of mind. What works better for serenity is something old and reliable. The ancient prophet Jeremiah said, stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it. And you will find rest for your souls. When they asked the millionaire how much money he wanted, he said, just a little bit more. Donald Horman says, we don't need to increase our goods nearly as much as we need to scale down our wants. <coughs> Not wanting something is as good as possessing it. One time writer with the Kansas City Star, Bill Vaughn said, a three-year-old child is a being who gets almost as much fun out of an expensive swing set as it does out of finding a small green worm. Can success be judged by how busy we are? Don't busyness and business, the noise and the toys, often distract and divert us from what's most important? Socrates said beware of the barrenness of a busy life. The gross national product, the GNP, may be less important than the ISP, the individual satisfaction product. True personal productivity is not amassing goods and services, but doing what we believe important. We accomplish that not by seeing how many tasks we can do and check off our to-do list, but by focusing on fewer but higher impact tasks. Albert Hubbard said, the sculptor produces the beautiful statue by chipping away such parts of the marble block as are not needed. It is a process of elimination. Plato said, the highest end that man can attain here below is to sit down and contemplate the good. Of course, Leslie Nielsen said, doing nothing is very hard to do because you never know when you're finished. <laughs> but contemplating the good is not equivalent to doing nothing if we let it direct our action. It tends to refresh our energy and assuage our anxieties about the future. George MacDonald said, it is not the cares of tomorrow, but the cares of today that weigh a man down. AA and the other 12-step groups use slogans to help focus on what's important. One is a day at a time. It's based on Jesus' words. <coughs> Think not of, uh, therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow. Let the day's own troubles be sufficient for the day. Jesus also said to his disciples, come apart into a desert place and rest a while. But you say, when do I have time to rest? Newspaper columnist Sidney J. Harris said, the time to relax is when you don't have time for it. The bartender who became poet laureate of England, John Masefield, used to lie down at noon and recite poetry. How does less is more apply to my day at home or at work? It means prioritizing and clearing the clutter, including unnecessary stuff, unnecessary activities, and unnecessary commitments. Clearing the clutter from your physical space helps to clear from your mental space. You've probably heard the expression, if you want to get a job done, give it to a busy person. Why is that? Could it be that that person is like the man described by Charles Dickens? He did every single thing as if he did nothing else. 
Single tasking in each job allows you to do more work through the day than multitasking does. Switching between projects is permitted. That's not multitasking. Just don't work on two at the very same time. My father used to say a change is as good as a rest. Some experts advise spending 10 minutes a day clearing clutter at home <coughs> and 10 minutes clearing clutter at work. If you choose to clean your desk, let's say, they say make three piles, stuff you use and need and like, stuff you can donate, and trash. Toss the trash, put the donate stuff in a box for drop off, and put everything else where it belongs. My problem is paper flow, where it doesn't belong. And I keep a, 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 uh, an extra box when I'm not sure. To clear clutter relating to tasks, appointments, commitments, activities, magazines, newsletters, social networks like Facebook, make an MIT list, not a Mitt Romney list, a most important task list and uh, of what you really need to retain and want to retain and drop the rest. Someone has said if you chase two rabbits, both will escape. Where necessary, send emails to announce those you're dropping. The neuropsychologist Rick Hansen says, admit that you can't carry five quarts in a one-gallon container. Actually, I'm not sure. I know the number of acres on my farm, but not the number of hectares. Someone has said, if God wanted us to use metric, Jesus would have had ten disciples. Would have had ten disciples. <laughs> Then he added, of course, if he wanted us to use the old English system, he would have given Moses 5,280 commandments. <laughs> I think there's 5,280 feet in a mile. Well, you say, I can reduce my speed, I can forget fast food, I can drop multitasking and toss some tasks. What else? They say deep breathe into your belly. Another name for that is diaphragm breathing. Lose um, a laugh and stay in the present. Go for a walk. When I lived in Dunville, I learned that one of the doctors at the clinic uh, went back and forth to work every day, rain or shine, by walking. And I also uh, learned that Ruth Stafford Peel, the late wife of the late Norman Vincent Peel, walked four miles a day when she was in her late 80s. I'm not sure about her 90s. She died when she was 99. I'm not sure how long she carried it on, but when she was in her late 80s, she was walking four miles a day. Don't we all need to walk to get the fresh air in our face, smell the fresh earth, clear the mind, think without thinking about it, see the stars, get into better shape? Of course, Bill Vaughn said, muscles come and go, flat lasts. <laughs> Probably most important, even if, you can only pursue it at, even if you can only pursue it at home, is to choose a task that excites you, that you believe will change you, change the world. One person calls this the amazing task. <coughs> this is the kind of decision of which Emerson said, the universe will conspire to bring it to pass. How do you find this task? Ask what excited you as a child. What activity are you doing when time seems to pass unnoticed? When I was 10 years old, I knew I wanted to be a writer and to speak in front of audiences. Now, it's a completely different speech as to why I didn't start until much later in life. But Frederick, Frederick Bigner says, the place God calls you to is where your deep gladness is and the world's deep hunger meet and get to that work early in the day. For less important tasks, including bill paying, paperwork, non-urgent emails, they say schedule maybe 30 minutes later in the day. When I had decided to read the biography of the great preacher Phillips Brooks, who spoke twice in Westminster Abbey, and the 14 Laws of Success by Napoleon Hill, I would never have got them read. They were both three to four inches thick, as thick as the uh, books we had to read uh, in, uh, on uh, Thomas Aquinas um, in, in religious studies. But I would never have got them read if I didn't get up at 4 o'clock in the morning. 
In India, the time from 4 to 6 a.m. is called the Brahmic time, the divine period. Okay, you say, but what if I suffer from anxiety and major depression? When I came out of the hospital in 1994, following drug treatment, I still had my depression, plus short-term memory damage. That's why I have to keep these notes handy. When I researched depression, I found the solution that works for me. It's in the sacred books. Deal with guilt and get my eyes off myself and onto the needs of others. I think the underlying secret was given by Jesus. Didn't he identify who my neighbor is? Love your neighbor as yourself, not as someone else. Not a stranger or enemy, but except for the different body, a carbon copy, a facsimile of me. Not someone to avoid or harm, but someone to help, and in helping, help myself. Have you noticed that life has a bounce back? What I do for others, good or bad, I do for myself. What I do for myself alone, I seem to do for nobody. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Maintaining this grateful, humble attitude is what simplifying your life is all about. Humility does not make selfish demands. Little Carol's birthday was coming up, and she said to her mother, Mom, I want a bike for my birthday. Knowing her daughter often got into trouble at school and at home, her mother thought, her mother asked her if she thought she deserved a bike. Little Carol said yes. Carol's mother wanted her to reflect on her behavior over the last year and told her to write a letter to God explaining why she deserved a bike. Little Carol stomped up the steps to her room and sat down to write. Dear God, I have been a very good girl this year and I would like a bike for my birthday. I want a red one. Your friend, Carol. Carol knew this wasn't true. She had not been a very good girl, and so she tore up the letter and started over. Dear God, this is your friend Carol. I have been a pretty good girl this year, and I would like a red bike for my birthday. Thank you, Carol. Carol knew this wasn't true either, so she tore up the letter and started over. Dear God, I know I haven't been a good girl this year. I am very sorry. I will be a good girl if you sent me a red bike for my birthday. Thank you, Carol. Carol knew even if this was true, it wasn't going to get her the bike. She went downstairs and told her mom she wanted to go to church. Carol's mother thought her plan had worked because Carol looked very sad. Just be home in time for dinner. Carol walked down the street to the Catholic church and up to the altar. She looked, to see, she looked around to see if anybody was there. She picked up a statue of the Virgin Mary, slipped it under her jacket, and ran out of the church, down the street, into her house and up to her room. She shut the door, sat down, and wrote to God letter number four. I got your mama. If you want to see her again, send the bike. Signed, you know who. As we approach the end, we've looked at the danger of the fast lane, the wisdom of listening to the still small voice, and the value of tossing the excess baggage. Antoine de Saint Exupéry said, Perfection is achieved not when there is nothing more to add, but when there is nothing left to take away. In listening to the voice of the world, and rushing to get to the top of the ladder, I knock the props out from under my own life and betray my soul. But in listening to the still small voice and slowing down, I keep peace with my soul. Henry Vaughn said, some men a forward motion love, but I by backward steps would move. And when this dust falls to the urn, in the state I came return. Pull your hand out of the hand of the Red Queen and stop running to stand still. Alice was right. What's the point of the mad rush if it's not getting us somewhere else? The faster, faster rush for self-advancement 
doesn't leave me feeling peaceful and contented when I lay my head on my pillow. That priceless feeling comes from being honest, slowing my speed, and helping others out of the ditches of life. Thomas Traherne, who was said to have found the secret of happiness long before he passed from this world at 37 years of age, said, I was made to learn the dirty devices of the world, which now I unlearn and become as it were a little child again, that I might enter the kingdom of God. A little child doesn't need things to make it happy. It needs only parents who love it. A little child has no enemies. It isn't worried about yesterday or anxious about tomorrow. And it isn't in a hurry. I don't know about you, but I cringe when I recall the number of times I said to one of my children, hurry up. May I suggest gently to you what I deserved to hear from that snowplow driver? Slow down. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.